Well, hello, everybody. So I'll go ahead and just get us started. Um, so welcome, everybody, and thank you all for coming tonight um, to the LaChat interview with Jeffrey Blount. My name is Gabriela Montesioca, and I am on the adult programming team of the Jacksonville Public Library. And I'm very excited to welcome you all I'm here at the Pablo Creek Library and to welcome our lovely Zoom audience. Just a few things before we get started. Um, the emergency exit is the front e entrance to the library or that exit right there. Um, and the bathrooms are out those doors and right across the hall. We ask that if you do go um, to the restroom during this time for our people on this side, just be mindful of the camera, just so we don't occlude our Zoom audience. So our two guests today will be chatting for the next 40 minutes, um, and then we'll go ahead and start taking audience questions using the note cards that you have at your seats right there. Um, and for those of us, you in the Zoom audience, you can send in your questions through the Q&A chat box, and we'll make sure that your questions get to our speakers. But now we'll go ahead and start the fun part of the evening. So Jeffrey Blunt is the award-winning author of four novels, including Almost No White, Hating Heidi Foster, The Emancipation of Evan Walls, and Mr. Jimmy from Around the Way. He's also an Emmy Award-winning television director and a 2016 inductee to the Virginia Communications Hall of Fame. During his 34-year career at NBC News, Jeffrey directed a decade of Meet the Press, the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, and major special events. He is the first African American to direct the Today Show. Yes, clap him, he's done a lot. And he was also a contributor to HuffPost, and he has been published in the Washington Post, the Grio.com, and other publications commenting on issues of race, social justice, and writing. He's done a lot in his life. <laughs> And Jeffrey will be joined in conversation with a local poet and artist, Fati D. Ashley. Fati is a Ghanaian-American literary and visual artist who resides here in Florida. She holds a Master of Arts in English from the University of North Florida, and her poem, Cape Coast, was performed in Echoes of Us, a series of curated monologues directed by Tony Award nominee Michelle Shea in 2022. She is the editor-in-chief for the Banyan Review, a 2023 Best of the Net nominee, and a fellow and a 2023 fellow of the Craft Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to curating culturally inclusive ecosystems throughout the world of art and entertainment. Ashley consults and facilitates workshops for the Authors Roundtable, which we love to host here at the library as well um, of North Florida. And she also teaches creative writing um, at Jacksonville Arts and Music School. So Fatih, I will leave the rest to you. Thank you so much, Gabriella, for introducing us to our live audience as well as our Zoom audience. I must say I am delighted to be here, uh, but especially delighted to be here with Jeffrey Blunt. Thank you so much for coming and sharing, you know, behind the curtain of Mr. Jimmy from around the way. Fantastic. So I won't waste too much time. I want to dig in because there is a lot uh, to talk about. So in your own words, tell me what Mr. Jimmy from Around the Way is about. Mr. Jimmy from Around the Way is about an, an African-American billionaire yes. who suffers a fall from grace. And like most of us, like most of us, when we do something wrong when we were kids, uh, your sibling, older sibling would yell at you, you run to your bedroom and hide near your cupboard because that's where you feel more comfortable. Mr. Yeah. Jimmy was powerful. Thank you. Testing one, two, one, two. Is that better? Okay. Um, so I don't know what you heard, so I'll start over. Uh, <laughs> he, Mr. Jimmy was a billionaire, and um, he, I'm still getting feedback, but he, um, he suffers a fall from grace. <laughs> We'll pass this back and forth. So he suffers a severe fall from grace, fractures his family, um, fractures his reputation as a businessman, and he runs to his home, which is the rural South, because that is where he was raised. And he hopes to hide from social media, um, traditional media, as he tries to find ways to redeem himself. And 
he finds because he buys his house sight unseen he walks into this house and hides out and then he finds that he is adjacent to a football field away a neighborhood mired in total abject poverty the kind of poverty we most of the time don't understand or believe exists in the United States of America and the book tracks his attempt to find personal redemption with his attempt to keep this community, especially after a, a pretty horrible discovery is made, he has to save himself at the same time to try and keep this community from falling apart in itself. So that's the storyline, and um, that's Mr. Jimmy uh, attempting to hide, finding a new challenge, and whether or not he can rise to that challenge, and whether or not there is any redemption for him, or if there is, what it might look like. How am I? Are we good? Okay, great. So I found the title grabbed me immediately as well. I get the opportunity to speak with you, read your book, and then get some redemption. And it was the title for me, specifically the part about from around the way. It is a colloquialism that rang out to me. And so I knew by that that I was going to be invited into a world specific to certain people and I didn't quite know what I would find uh, a lot like the character Mr. Jimmy so I'm wondering out of all of the worlds you could have given us access to why this one because uh, <clears throat> this community is representative of a, a piece of us of the United States of America that we don't recognize we choose not to see they exist, like many of the real communities, in a state of what sociologists now call social death, which means that you have a group of people who are continually living in this kind of squalor, and we as a society have decided, for whatever reason, that we are comfortable not seeing them and comfortable living, leaving them in this state. There is no political uh, way out of it, and so the generations continue. The cycle of poverty continues. The lack of health care, the lack of justice, equal justice, the lack of education, um, on and on and on, just continues on the wheel because there's no one to intervene um, to stop it. I wanted to point to that. It was uh, it, it allowed me to talk about, you know, the mission of what I what I call from this book the activism of kindness, for all of us to step up and recognize. Um, that there are many of us who exist in these worlds. We need to see them. We need to acknowledge each other's humanity. Um, and we need to not stand by. And Mr. Jimmy, in my way, is a roadmap for those of us, including those of us who are with extreme wealth, who can do more, um, as a roadmap to breaking into these situations and making a difference. In your description, You said that Mr. Jimmy, who is James Henry Ferguson, Ferguson yeah. and we'll talk about the two names, he's a billionaire. Why make Mr. Jimmy a billionaire? Why is that important to the overall story that you're telling us? Well, first of all, it's important to me because I used to speak in D.C. public schools. Um, I live in Washington, D.C. Um, via a nonprofit called DC Cap. And the idea was that African American and, uh, and Latino um, Americans would speak in classrooms to kids who are black and, and Latino about the possibilities that existed for them in the business world. So I would go into these meetings with these students and the first thing I would ask is, what do you see yourself doing? What do you want to do down the road? And almost every time they would say, I want to be an athlete, I want to be an entertainer. Why is that? Well, I think I'm good at it, but I also know that that's my way of making money. Well, did you know you can make money doing what I do? No. Um, and so, but how much money do you make? You know, these people make a lot of money. You know, when I'm looking at the basketball players or hundreds of millions of dollars and and the entertainers, hundreds of millions of dollars. Do you have that kind of money? So what I wanted to show them was that if those students 
were to pick up this book and read it, and they remember me, they would know that I'm sending a message that it is possible for you to reach the top in the business world too. Here is an example, and if you do a little bit of research, you'll see there are more examples of that. So it's just a way of speaking to those kids from me to say, um, there are so many more ways for you to achieve the goal that you just told me you wanted to achieve. You want you know, financial stability. Um, you would like the opportunity to do really well financially. There's nothing wrong with that. There are many different ways to do that. And the other thing is, I appreciate folks like Magic Johnson who went into neighborhoods and created businesses. But many of those businesses created, you know, um, minimum wage jobs. And one of the things I'd like to do, and, and I'm, not, I'm not knocking that, what I'm trying to do is add to that. And I'm trying to show that we should be telling our kids um, that there are, there, that there is uh, a way to own their entrepreneurship is something we should be thinking about too. Not just working for somebody, you be magic, you own the, you own the movie theater. And, but if you don't tell kids to think about it, they won't think about it that way. So even I, I mean, I, I have lots of friends who have had very successful businesses. I didn't grow up with that mindset. My parents was like, we want you to go get an education. We want you to get a really good job so you can take care of yourself. It never occurred to me that, you know, I could just quit my job and go off and start a business and, and it would work. <laughs> like it had for so many, for several of my friends. So I want people to know and understand when they read this book and they talk to their children that there are like so many other options and, um, and we're talking about creating generational wealth by ownership um, and become an entrepreneur. So all of that falls into why Mr. Jimmy was a billionaire. Well, you've given me my entry point into the characters, okay. which you have created a fantastic uh, world of characters. There's something for everyone I found in it. And so since we're talking about kids, let's talk about some of the, ch the children uh, in Mr. Jimmy from around the way. I'm personally fond of, of Juba, but yes. you may speak of the others. <laughs> um, and the time that's spent with them, there seems to be a theme about worth. Yes. Worth as far as um, dollars and cents, yeah. but then the worth that is the kind that you take with you, that you live with. And so can you speak more to why you spent, I think, quite a bit of time coming back to that topic as you're dealing with the children about worth, self worth. It was a major reason I decided to write the book. Mm -hmm. So when I started researching this book and researching poverty, I went to YouTube and I looked up, I was looking for some documentaries about poverty and I couldn't find any that um, about, you know, specifically to the South, which is what I was writing about. But I found a video that a woman, I, I couldn't read the, the last page of the video, which I think was um, in its original you know, resolution, was the title of her nonprofit that she had. Uh, but she was out in this neighborhood with her family camera, it looked like, and she was asking questions of people. And so she came up on this couple, and the guy was really tall, and the wife was you know, just the right size to fit under his arm comfortably, and they, and they were standing in front of this shack, and I was looking at the house and thinking that in any neighborhood or city where we cared about our people, we would not allow people to live in this kind of a house. So she starts talking to him. And he starts to tell her that he's a sharecropper. He was out of work. He got sick. And if you can't work, they kick you out of the house and put somebody else in the house who can go into the fields and work. It was Christmas time, he was telling her, I'm gonna do things for my kid, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take care of things, I'm gonna be the man, I'm gonna do all this stuff. And I started thinking about Meet the Press when I was on Meet the Press. And I'm thinking, when people came on that show, they came on that show to, uh, to make a point, but they also wanted to look good. They wanted to, be rep they wanted to represent themselves properly so that you would respect the image and the knowledge that they were showing. And we have a whole, um, you know, 
bunch of people or, 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 or a, a media group in, in DC, all they do is train people to go on television to look good, media trainers, right? And so you, you want to be respected. You know that the camera is on you and that is requiring something of you so that when people watch you, um, they think highly of you. So this man is looking into that camera and now you see he, his hair is unkempt, he doesn't have a lot of teeth, his clothing is threadbare, and he's trying to use big words that he's heard floating in the air somewhere and it's all coming out wrong, and he's trying desperately to, to, to tell her that he is something. And I started thinking back to the men who marched in the sanitation um, uh, protests with Dr. King in the late 1960s, and they had the placard that said, I am a man. And I'm looking at this man, and he is looking in the camera, and he is trying his hardest to say to this woman and to anybody who watches this, I'm doing all this stuff. I, I, I am somebody. I am a man. But I could look in his eyes and see he didn't believe it himself. And neither did his wife because as he started talking, she started crying. She cried a little more, and she cried a little more until she just had to break away and walk off camera and leave him. And I was devastated. It was really hard to watch this man struggle to make himself worthy for us. And I thought that this had to be a huge part of the book. Because in a neighborhood like this, with this kind of poverty, there has to be times, and certainly there were times with Juba and his family and the other kids, where they knew their situation. And they knew their worth or lack thereof in the eyes of other people. So I wanted people to read it and people like me to read it and see the worth of other human beings and for people who are in that situation who love to read and, and might somehow find this book to know that you are worthy and there's, there's something inside of you which the character um, the fountain used there's something inside of you that we all have that we can turn into something to make something of ourselves. We just have to have somebody to help us show, show us that, which is what Mr. Jimmy does. But that video was a, a huge piece of why I felt I needed to re write this book. Well, can you read a little bit for us? Okay. Yeah. I mean, how yeah. many of you have read it? How many of you have read the book? Oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah. A plus. Yeah. yeah. So Mr. Jimmy, I'll set this up. Mr. Jimmy arrives in Ham, Mississippi, and he has a conversation with Miss Septima, a 92-year-old lady who is a football field away, his nearest neighbor. Other than that, he stays in his house because he's trying to lick the wounds and heal himself for, from the bad choices that he has made. But after a few weeks, he decides it's time to step out and start his new life. He doesn't know anything. He's met Miss Septima, but he doesn't, he's not paid any attention to the neighborhood around the way. It's all of him about himself in his house. A deep, full breath accompanied his first steps. Country air seemed to be the same everywhere, he thought. Lung candy, his mother sometimes called it, fresh and sweet. The soft crunching sound of his shoes in the unsophisticated dirt also brought him comfort. Even the old for sale sign added to his rustic bucolic sensibility. His eyes smiled. The grasses in the field were beginning to show the first signs of their autumn browning. Soon the leaves would be turning, boasting a palette of gold, brown and orange. This is why he came here. To hear nothing but birds in the rooster's morning call, to be in a space that reminded him of a simpler time in his life where good, kind people were living good, decent lives, striving to better themselves in a less complicated world. But the joke really was on him, fully, because Ham, Mississippi was not the world James Henry Ferguson had in mind. And so he would take his walk and his life would change. The section you decided to read, as you 
you, you prefaced it, you said, okay, this is after his fall from grace. Yes. Okay. And so to be clear, uh, Mr. Jimmy is James Henry Ferguson, and he is an African-American man. We know he's a billionaire. But given his situation uh, that takes place in the big city, um, it's hard to read. It is, it's scandalous. May I say that? Yes, you may. Yep. It, is, it is scandalous <laughs> why he's leaving. Yep. Um, and so my question to you is, did you, how did you face the challenges of one potentially navigating tropes of um, black men um, falling into scandal publicly and uh, what you may have faced in, in, in writing, writing that uh, and why you may have found it necessary to, to make his fall from grace what it was? Well, the, in the book, I make sure that you know that his life is being turned into one of the tropes because I use social media in the book to um, illuminate certain things, and that's one of them. So people, there are certain phrases where he goes online and, and people are saying things about him, and they're saying things that are tropes about black men that he now falls into. So... <clears throat> One of the reasons of being black is the most, is the greatest and most constant conflict of my life. So Mr. Jimmy, for me, is the same. And he has to exist within the, the, the stereotypes and the tropes, even though he is breaking stereotypes just by how he has been living and his achievements. But the book shows you that even with that, as it was with President Miss Obama, you still will be held in a certain way from, from many, many people because of your skin color. And they will say things about you. They will write things about him um, to try and put him, keep him in those stereotypes. But the thing is, is that Mr. Jimmy has been given a gift. Mr. Jimmy has been raised by amazing parents who gave him the gift of believing that even when he fell, that he was something better than what everybody else was saying about him. It hurt him, and he gets upset, and he gets very emotional about the things that are said, but at the same time, he keeps moving forward. It's what he knows now. He knows he's been successful. He knows these, that what he can do, even though it hurts him to be labeled certain things. Um, and I think as he progresses through the story and the people from around the way begin to care for him, it reinforces the fact that he, his journey to becoming Mr. Jimmy, to becoming James Henry Ferguson, is a wonderful thing. And there's a point in the book, and, and I, this is not going to give anything um, too important away, where he becomes billionaire and he calls his parents to tell them that I just became a billionaire. And they asked something of him, and I'll let you read that, but they asked something of him that points him back to where he, what he is rooted into and where all of that self-belief comes up and helps him through the stereotypes. And one of the things I, I touch on that I think is a little bit um, controversial for some people, uh, and I wanted to write about this, is thinking of pre President Obama and, um, and African Americans who have had that kind of soaring success. So you get some people who are quite happy for you that you've had that success. And you get some people who are not, and even amongst your own people will put you in the stereotype group of something negative. And so Mr. Jimmy's life spans a whole lot of stereotypes. And what keeps him, again, what keeps him going forward is what's in his core, and that was given to him by mom and dad. Thank you for bringing up media. Mm -hmm. it's the, the arrangement of, of the novel itself and the textures that are in there, it includes not only the prose, but you have different social media um, platforms that are in there as well as traditional 
uh, media outlets. And of course, with your background, you're <laughs> going to have some memes uh, <laughs> right. in there, and it's 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 aptly placed. But I found that uh, the media, in all its forms, also served as another character. Yes. Uh, in in the novel itself, and it seems to be a character that has some of the greatest access uh, to Mr. Jimmy. Did you set out to include the range wrote the book? He said, okay, I'm including me. Yes, because I knew that if he fell from grace and if I wanted to explore the idea of a modern day scarlet letter and where somebody had done something wrong, where they needed redemption, and um, <clears throat> if they were gonna try to get past that redemption, you know, I had to, I had to establish that. So, modern day Scarlet Letter. Yeah, a well, modern day Scarlet Letter, and in the in the media is the one who will decide that. You know, we might from neighborhood to neighborhood decide something about somebody, but I learned when I was a cub reporter in my hometown newspaper that you can write one column, and that one column, you know, influences and informs tens of thousands of people as opposed to you having a uh, conversation in the coffee shop. So the power of the media, both traditional and social media, was overwhelming for him. And it followed him, even to rural, rural Ham, Mississippi. And, um, and I wanted to explore, as a, just as a writer, as part of the story, what we as a nation, what we as smaller communities, uh, or how how capable are, are we of allowing for people to make mistakes and then have a, a comeback? And you know, in the in one of the epigraphs in the book is um, from Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice, Equal Justice Initiative. He says, "Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done." Is that really true? Does the media agree with us? I'm not so sure. Neither am I. <laughs> so the book is definitely, it has a redemption thread, but there's also a theme of shame yes. uh, in, in the novel. And Mr. Jimmy has two daughters. Yes. Okay. And he has to face them. And this was one of the most gripping scenes for me to uh, read and how, I mean, Again, you'll read it, but <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have him read you just a little bit of, of this scene. Do you want to set it up? And then, sure. Okay. So Mr. Jimmy's fall has happened, and he's been waiting <clears throat> for the girls to come home, his two adult daughters, knowing that there's going to be hell to pay. Catherine is the firebrand. And, and you know, throughout the book, there there are points where you well, I, even I when I was writing had to laugh because I knew that when Catherine came in, she was taking no prisoners, and um, and and everybody was going to suffer if she was suffering, um, and so <coughs> he he's finally sitting down with his family, including the girls, trying to come to grips with what he's done, and what um, he's done to them. Catherine raged. James withdrew. She was a whirlwind of contempt. She was a tempest of hurt and tears. She paced before the three of them, her eyes puffy, wet, and red. Her face was riddled with tension. She was often doubled over in screams of profane disappointment. She might well have been experiencing withdrawal, he thought, from the insidious drugs of love and trust that he had been giving her since the day she was born. Now she had all but come undone in front of them. He had brought his little girl to this. On his desk in his office, there was a picture of the two of them. That's dad and, the, and Catherine. She could have only been weeks old. He sat with her on the couch in their first home, Catherine a cuddle ball on his chest, her head sweetly tucked into his neck and shoulder. She was asleep, and he was quietly looking into Rebecca's camera with a soft and loving smile on his face as she took their picture. Rebecca is his wife. 
Of course he understood that at that age his baby girl had no idea what she was doing, but to him it felt like she understood that he was her father and that she could lay her weight, her love, and her burdens on his shoulder, that she instinctively knew her love and her need to trust were not only safe with him, but absolutely treasured by him. He would give his life to protect them. That is what she had grown up believing, and behind her, Lillian. James so loved his time with the girls as they grew. He endeavored to make himself as indispensable as Rebecca. He wanted them to be able to share their emotional needs with him as easily as they might with Rebecca. He worked so hard to be at their medical checkups. He went on school field trips. He knelt beside them and guided them through their prayers. They read together, they sang together, played games together. They sat and talked about life. When they were little, they loved to have him brush and braid their hair after their baths. By the time they had reached middle school, they knew their daddy was undeniably dependable. And that is what they believed until he proved himself to be anything but. Winding down from a good 20 minutes of exasperation, Catherine sighed deeply. Looking up to the ceiling, she said, truly, I just, I just cannot believe that we are here. Here, sitting with, but apart from his family, James let the word seep into him and sit with him so that he could fully acknowledge the damage that rested in its meaning. Here represented the absolute worst moment of existence for him and his family. Here was their lives turned inside out. Here was the inability to defend himself or his family as the world came crashing down upon them. tragedy in, in the novel, um, you know, you're looking at, at, at poverty, damaged relationships. There is a love story yes. in here also. <coughs> and it, it leads me to ask you this, this question. Are you a foodie? Are, is there a <laughs> thing you have for, for food and, and wine? Because I, it, it seems as though those, uh, the, sen the sensory elements of those things help to characterize the romance between um, James and Rebecca. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, <coughs> I don't know that I would call myself a foodie because I think foodies, for me at least, foodies know how to cook. Okay. And I cooked until my children begged me to stop cooking. <laughs> but I do like to eat. And uh, my mother was an amazing, amazing Southern cook. Mm -hmm. and, um, and all of the women on the, the Delk side, my mother's side of the family, were amazing cooks. Um, you know, and so I did love to eat their food. There were you know, particular items that she made and, and others made in the families that I can taste when I think about them. Mm -hmm. So I did love, I, yes. Um, so in that way, I, I am a foodie. Okay. Um, and I wanted to give Rebecca and James something um, that they could do together where they were talking and they were, this is a, a joy, an absolute daily joy for them to see each other, to be with each other at the end of the day and they would decide what they were gonna cook. And while they cooked, they talked about their lives and that's how, and, and that's how he would remember the moment throughout the book even when he knew he had lost it. And I, you know, I think there's a, for me, I think there's a couple of romances. Okay. So you read the book, so you know that there's James and Rebecca, mm -hmm. husband and wife. Yeah. But there's also James and Miss Septima, Mr. Jimmy and Miss Septima. It's not a traditional romance, but it is an elderly woman who he has an amazing amount of feeling and love for, yeah. and it is returned. And their relationship, for me, is quite special. And for me, was very emotional to write, which meant I knew I felt like I had it right because as Robert Frost says, um, if there are no tears in the writer, there are no tears in the reader. And so when I got to the point where I was writing Miss Septima and I was feeling that so much, I kind of felt like I had that, that romance really right. Yeah. 
and you, you you toy around with that in there too, and you, you will you will laugh for sure. I feel like I know Miss Miss Septima. I think most of you probably know Miss Septima. If you read it, yes. you know you know this lady. Yes. You do know her. <laughs> and the that maternal um, thread or um, the support of of women, I think, really helps to carry um, Mr. Jimmy. Oh, absolutely. In, with, without in it, the book. without it, he would not be successful. And sure. I think he learns how to deal with his shame because particularly one particular night and at dinner with several of those, the, the, the older, the matriarchs of the community, um, they teach him something about fortitude and, and coming through some things. And, and Mr. Jimmy, there's shame for what he did um, for some of the, the children. There's shame for the fact that when he finally says, we're going to read together, there's shame because they should know how to read, and at their age, they know they don't. There's shame for several of the members of the community who want better for themselves, and they don't know how to find better for themselves. Um, so it, it continues throughout the book purposefully because this is part of the um, social death that we, that we leave them in, this kind of shame, and it is a hard thing to climb out of that. Mr. Jimmy's try, trying to find some sort of redemption and these people are just trying to find a way to comfort in life. Uh, and that means spiritually, emotionally, and in terms of, of, uh, uh, of, of money and, and possessions. So shame is something that I wanted to show that through the village, mm -hmm. through the kind of activism of kindness that Mr. Jimmy is all about, that we can make inroads into to dealing with shame. Speaking of Miss Septima, and there are two quotes I want you to speak to here. Okay. One of them, she says, and it's air pressure, water pressure, blood pressure. Yes. Can you so talk about that? For air us? pressure, blood pressure, water pressure is something that Miss Septima will tell Mr. Jimmy, James, when he is going through some things, and she tells him. When you hear the kind of stuff she has lived through, you know she needed something strong to get through it. But this was her, her method. And she would say, I get up every morning, I check the air pressure, blood pressure, water pressure, put one foot in front of the other, and I keep going. And, I next, and when, at nighttime, I try to drop that day off my shoulder. And the next morning, it's air pressure, water pressure, blood pressure. The phrase has received a lot of attention, um, and I, I've had to talk about it a lot. And it comes, it's not mine. It's from my oldest and dearest friend, and my brother from another mother, uh, my chosen family. And when you read the acknowledgement, you'll see it's, and there's a, I, I thank Perry Nick Bell, and I say air pressure, water pressure, blood pressure, you know. This comes from uh, Perry's wife, having to need a double lung transplant now 15 years ago. And she was doing great. And then, um, you know, then the doctors had told them they had no idea, because she was one of the first to go through this procedure. They had no idea how long she was going to be with us or what it was going to look like. Well, things started to go downhill. And it was very hard for Perry and, and Luetta. And we talked a lot. We are like brothers. We talk a lot. We support each other. Um, and we show a lot of love for each other. And so I was calling him all the time. And he and Luetta used that phrase to get through the tough times for each other. And then it switched over to the point where we use that phrase in conversation because he allowed me to use it. And then I was allowed to say it to him on those con phone conversations to help him get through these issues, particularly at the point when his wife passed. And so after she had passed, and I was working on the book, and I called him, I said, Perry, you know what? Air pressure, blood pressure, water pressure, one step at a time, that works in my story. Would you allow me to use it? And he reminded me, he said, at this point, it's as much yours as it is mine because we have been using it to help each other sustain each other. And so that's where that comes from. And it's 
it's one of the most special phrases in the book for me. And um, so anyway. Thank you for sharing the, the personal background on that. I read it and thought, is this yours? Because it's, it's, so, it's so nicely yeah. uh, placed. Oh, what a lovely note or story to start us off for our audience question section. So thank you guys for such mm -hmm, a great conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to open up for audience questions from the people here in person and from our Zoom audience. Um, so if you're here in person, Obviously, you can write your questions down on your note cards, and I and some volunteers will be around to collect them and get them to Fati. Um, if you're in our Zoom audience, please do submit them through the Q&A chat box, and we'll get them. Um, so just please write and type, and we'll pass them along. And I see we already have a couple out in the audience. Question from the audience. I once worked in Southeast Ward 8 DC, which was a level of urban, urban poverty I had just not seen before. How would a Mr. Jimmy approach work to address poverty in such a setting? I think Mr. Jimmy would do very much what Mr. Jimmy did even in the rural South, because sometimes an equation is the same um, you know, in the one plus one is two there and one plus one is two there. And uh, <clears throat> what Mr. Jimmy does is um, he places himself in the midst of other people's problems and troubles. And I think sometimes when we look at what happens, what's happening in the district, we as a community, we sit back and we wait for the mayor, we wait for the city council to make laws and make changes. That should happen. Um, and one of the things Mr. Jimmy says is that, you know, we wait for, we, we, we wait too much for government to assist us. Not that they shouldn't. We should still be marching. We should still be demanding. But at the same time, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And we should be doing what we can in our communities to help ourselves. So Mr. Jimmy, he would be James Henry Ferguson there. Yes. Um, and James Henry Ferguson would have, he, and you, and I should say, you, you probably would ask, well, why didn't he do all this before when he was in DC? Well, he does. And you'll see what he does. And you'll see how he and his wife are, are incredibly respected for their philanthropic nature in Washington, DC. Um, but it is a, a grassroots movement that I'm trying to show that needs to happen in Ham, Mississippi and needs to happen in Washington, D.C. It starts with individuals who agree that they're going to make change. They keep adding, they keep building. And when I say that, it sounds like, <coughs> you know, everybody says that. So let me give you an example. Anybody seen the, the documentary Crip Camp? If you haven't seen it, you should. This is a documentary about disabled children who went to a camp in upstate New York in the late 60s, early 70s. And the parents sent them, sent them there because they could be with other disabled children. They weren't laughed at, they weren't disrespected. They had infrastructure so that they could live properly. But they knew they had to go home to the real world. And the real world didn't have infrastructure. You know, you couldn't even get up on the sidewalk at the time. There were no ramps on the sidewalk. The bathrooms uh, for disabled people didn't exist, on and on and on. So these kids had a discussion. And I'll shorten the story by telling you, C CNN refers to it as Camp Revolution. Those kids started a process, a protest, a movement, and long story short, several of them were there when the, the, the um, Disabilities, American Disabilities Act was signed. They started it wow. at a camp in upstate New York. So what can't you start in your neighborhood? That's what Mr. Jimmy would be doing. 
Mr. Jimmy would be having those conversations and bringing people into a movement that they themselves can control and got strong enough. They didn't have to ask in the Crip camp, they didn't have to ask politicians to help them. They got to a point where politicians couldn't refuse their demands. And that's, the, that's what Mr. Jimmy is building here. He's building a community that speaks to the larger community now. Now that we've found ourselves, now that we are someone, you cannot deny who we are. That's what Mr. Jimmy would be doing in DC. Good question. Thank you. Next, why did you pick Mississippi as the particular southern state for the setting? And then the follow-up to that, or an additional piece, is what did you take into consideration as you were choosing individual characters' names? OK. Oh, I like that. Uh -huh. um, <coughs> so when I started doing research, I looked at Virginia, my home state, um, and I grew up around rural poverty. I had friends who are, um, you know, I consider myself a Southern writer, so I wanted to put it in a Southern context, although I have a good friend in Moss Point, Mississippi, who says I'm only, Virginia only makes me an honorary Southerner. <laughs> um, but so I wanted to set it in, in a place that I had some reference to, and that could be any number of states. And then I started doing my research. And even in the book, um, Olivia Faye Carroll, his friend tells you why I chose Mississippi. Mississippi, she continued, has the highest rate of poverty in the nation, and we seem to be in a race to the bottom with several other southern states. Nothing to be proud of. That's for damn sure, Yankee added. That's her husband. Olivia cont continued, second highest obesity rate, second highest rate of uninsured, 46 out of 50 in education, and a sad affairs, no doubt. Mississippi, unfortunately, makes itself the poster child for a story like this. Even as I wrote this book, the Southern Poverty Law Center was suing the state because they were, as like a, they were not taking care of their education. There was a malpractice education in the state of Mississippi. And even just recently, and I, I, there are political reasons why the governor of Mississippi did this, but there's, to me there are some points when politics should be set aside. The federal government was offering states money to pay for food for children in the summer, kids who you know, go to school and, and have their breakfast. The governor of Mississippi turned that down. This is why the book is in Mississippi. Oh, and the other part was choosing the, the choosing the characters. Well, choosing characters is one of my favorite parts of any of any novel, and particularly the names. Okay. Um, I love the. That's another thing I love about being a Southerner and the kinds of names that we have in the South. And, um, and you know, e even on my my book tour here, when I would meet younger people, I was just at a high school today, and at home I'm Jeffrey Blunt, and today I was Mr. Jeffrey, and I loved it. <laughs> and I just loved it. And so um, I think that there are names that we can give our characters, and it, just the way they sound in your head create a part of who the character is for you. Um, and when I say Juba for this little boy, and I think when you read the book, you'll understand what that means. At one point, when he, when he introduces himself and he said, that's a king, Africa king name when he's trying to impress Mr. Jimmy. But you'll understand um, who he is basically when you first meet him and he starts talking to Mr. Jimmy. And so I like to pick names and titles for people that have that feeling. There's a character named Fountain Hughes in the book. And he, his transformation, I think, is huge. He is actually named after a real slave. And Fountain Hughes, the original, you can hear in the writer's project, you know, during um, the New Deal when they sent people out to interview folks, you can actually look up Fountain Hughes and you can hear him speak. And when he talks about never having shoes till he was 13 when he was a slave, when he talked about as a slave boy, he couldn't even have pants until he got old enough to wear the men's pants because they wouldn't, they wouldn't make pants for, for the boys. He talked about being 
re, re, when he was released, when, when freedom came, he was tossed out like cattle into the field with nothing to, to, um, to, to feed him and, and nowhere to go. He talked about being less than a dog. And at the end of that, you, you, it's like Miss Septim, at the end of that, you felt still the power of this man, the force of this man. And in fact, he was lecturing the, um, the guy who was interviewing him about not getting in debt, and taking care of your money and all this kind of stuff. So I had such respect for him, having gone through what he had gone through, to be able to tell his story honestly, without worry, and to educate me more about where I came from and what my ancestors went through. Um, and that ties me to something. So, you know, I can look back on, on um, Ancestry.com. I had my DNA done, and there are many African countries that I, I might belong to. But in the Middle Passage, we lost who we really belonged to. And Fountain Hughes gave me a little bit of that. And when I started writing Mr. Jimmy from around the way, I knew that Fountain Hughes, I had to pay homage to him by naming this character. So I will do that in many. There's a doctor called Dr. Longford, who is named after my doctor, my hometown, who when the, the bigger um, organizations came in and bought out their, their practice, they made an edict that he could no longer go to people's houses and do um, house visit, and he said, to hell with that, I'm going, and he did. And when this man died, it was an amazing outpouring of love because, and it didn't matter if you were black or white. He was white, he was British. When my great-grandmother, Mama Jenny, was dying, he came to her house when everybody was uh, uh, sitting there, he knew everybody, shook everybody's hand, hugged everybody, and he went and he sat in there and talked to Mama Jenny like it was his mother. And when my mom was suffering from dementia, I carry a, a picture on the phone of Dr. Longford coming into a room where my mom was sitting by himself at, herself at this event. And Dr. Longford sits beside her, takes her hands in his hands, and no matter what she says to him, he's having a conversation with Doris. And that's who he was, and so I wanted to pay tribute to him as well. So I do that with characters too. I think then you answered this other question okay. about crafting characters. Yeah. You know, there is yeah. inspiration um, from your exposure to people, places, things. So the next couple of questions are also about craft, your process in general. So okay. um, they're asking it, you know, do you use an outline to, you know, to, to get your stories going? And then additionally, is, is your approach different when you're writing, say, historical fiction versus fantasy, a fantasy-based novel. Okay. Um, uh, my, I, I have yet to do a workshop on, on writing in terms of um, how I, I, I do my writing, what my process is, mm -hmm. because it's so odd, and I don't really know how to tell people what I do. I, when my book before this, The Emancipation of Evan Walls, was being written and coming down to the end, I was still working full-time at NBC. And it was hard for me to find times that I could write for hours at a, at a stretch. And you know, people like to write every day. That was never going to happen for me. So what I did was start carrying the characters in my head. And when, when I was at lunch, I would go out to my car and I'd sit, eat a sandwich, and the characters would be rolling around in my head. And carpool, picking up my son, the characters are rolling around in my head. And so then when I sat down at the computer, I was ready to go. Even still, because the hours were strange, because w both my wife and I worked in television and your, your life is dictated by what's happening in the news, you can't even depend on when you're going to get those two or three hours. So you need to be able to write like that. Well, I love music like I'm sure all of us do, and my classical music happens to be soundtracks. I love soundtracks from my, from my favorite stories. Um, and so I will associate a soundtrack with a book. And after a, a time, that music becomes the book. So I can play, there's an obscure movie called the, the World We Make, and I would turn that music on, and I'm in the mood for Mr. Jimmy, immediately. And then I would read the last four pages that I had written, and then I'm off and running. 
So I could start writing at any time. Now, I didn't end up ever using an outline because I was carrying all this in my head. And, and I would end up, one of the things I want to say is that write, we often think of writing as, as the typing, the actual typing and the actual handwriting. Writing can take place here before you get there. I feel like I've written my first draft for each chapter before I start writing. It's in here. I'll be on the elliptical sometimes a little longer than normal and I come upstairs and my wife will say, did you have a good writing session? <laughs> because she knows that's where a lot of it comes from. And it's hard to tell people how to put that together. You know, I have friends who have the sticky things on the wall and each character has one and the plot has one and I see it. When I, when I visit and I look at what they're doing, I see it. I can't do it. <laughs> I crafted this thing now and so it, it, and the most I can get is maybe four hours at a stretch. And the last piece I'll tell you is that when I, I got a black belt in karate when I was in high school and competed up and down the, the eastern seaboard, and Mr. Ogawa, my sensei, used to say to us, when you go home and practice, and I want you to practice as hard as you practice here in the dojo, but when you go home and practice, remember this, when you get to the moment that your fundamentals start to slip, you are to stop because everything you do after that is creating bad habits. So I use the same thing with my writing. I will write until I feel like I'm beginning to force myself and if I'm forcing myself, it's not coming the way I want it, then I will stop. Sometimes that's a half hour. Sometimes it's three hours. Sometimes it might be four hours. So there is nothing routine to how I write my books. My agent just laughs about me when I tell this story because she has a fair number of authors who write, you know, six hours a day. Um, I just can't do that. But I've developed a strange way of doing it to get through that book while I was working and now it works for me. Fantastic <laughs> tip for, for writers, yeah. for, for sure. Yeah. So you've trained yourself behaviorally. This is my cue with the music. Exactly. And it, it comes. Yeah. I, I love it. Okay, another craft question. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, nope, you answered that one too. And you finish your first draft. Do you finish your first draft quickly or do you self-edit as you go? Yeah, I self-edit here first. Uh -huh. And then I, will, then I will finish the first draft. But actually for me, by the time I get to the end of the first draft, I've already done quite a bit of editing because when I start, as I told you, when I sit down, I read the last four pages, I edit in those last four pages. Um, I'm always making changes up until the end when I'm always making changes. Someone asked me um, earlier, um, when do you know it's finished? And I responded with, I think what is one of the great um, uh, sayings about writing is a novel is never finished, it's abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to get to that point where you just say, okay, I'm a, it's over, I'm, I'm abandoning it because otherwise I would just keep tinkering. This is also a craft question, but I, I like the way it's framed. What do you find encourages you throughout your writing process? So you've told us about the process. What encourages you throughout it? Good question. Uh, so all of my books have a mission. I believe in the literary activism. And for me, that every book that I write, I start with um, a mission that I want to happen. This Mr. Jimmy is the activism of kindness that I want us to, to leave with when um, we do that. So. Um, I, I, I start um, with that in mind um, and then I try to build that you know into the, the I, I let the story take me along that path I, I create these characters that I that are emotionally attached to this mission um, and I put one or two in the beginning and I start the process of writing them and then um, I know where they're supposed to go, and most of the time I take them there. Other times they change things for me. And I, that's one of the weird things when people say, well, a writer will say, well, the character will change things for me. How does that work that the character decides for you? It's like you have a conversation with someone, and the conversation is going one way, and then quickly they say something else, responding the way you did, but it's nowhere near where you thought this conversation was going to go. That's what happens. You'll be writing and you know the character will be going one way and then all of a sudden it's like one way to go. One thing that happened to me was the ending of the book. So I finished the book on, and at my wife's family's place on the, in a little island off the coast of Portland, Maine. 
and sitting on the sun porch, and I finish the book, close the laptop, take a deep breath. Because one of the things that happens for me that means something for me while I'm writing the book is my emotional attachment to the characters, to the story. I love writing. Writing brings me peace, brings me calm. It lets me have a voice in the only way that I, I, I the only way I feel I have the most powerful voice is through my writing. And so I finish my book on the porch, close the laptop, and I think it's done. I go for a run, and halfway in my run, the characters say, you're not done. <laughs> we don't like how you finished it for us. And I came right back to the porch and sat down and rewrote it, and that's the ending that's in the book today. So you've got to be flexible. Well, I think you guys know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sadly always the bearer of time is up. <laughs> Someone's got to do it. Um, so thank you all for all your wonderful questions, and thank you to Fatih and for Jeffrey for giving us such wonderful insight um, into the process of writing. So I just want to say thank you all for coming, and in a, speci a special thanks to Jeffrey and Fatih. Give it up. They did such a wonderful job. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you all had a wonderful time listening to them and learning from them. So if you like today's program, you might be interested in our other upcoming programs. Um, so for those of you who are interested in local history, um, we have a history chat on the life of Captain James W. Floyd, a celebrated war hero and civil rights activist, February 10th at the main library. And if you're interested in romance, we have a lit chat interview with a local romance author named Emily Rath. And you can find more information on these upcoming programs and more on a thank you email that you will receive from us. Um, and that thank you email will also include a survey. And we ask that if you can uh, take the time to fill it out, please do. We really appreciate um, having feedback and learning from you guys and improving our programs through that feedback. Um, so for those of you here in the library, um, do give us a couple minutes to prepare for the book signing um, outside. And while you wait, um, Jeffrey's books are available for sale with our local bookseller, The Bookmark, outside. So thank you guys again for being here and hope to see you guys next time. Can I say one, I need to oh. say one, one thing very quickly because I think this is important. Um, s someone asked if it would be an audiobook. It will be, and the reason it's delayed is, is because of me. Um, and and well, a lot of people say publishers don't give authors choices. Some do. Um, the if you ever heard of the book The Other West Moore, which was written by the the governor of Maryland, um, the guy who read his book, I wanted to read Mr. Jimmy, but he's in in high demand, and by the time he could free his schedule to read it, um, we we couldn't stop the process that was going for the 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 book itself, but. He is finished, and it should be March 1st, I think, or the first week of March when it comes out in an audiobook. Okay.